Professor Dr. Karl Hack, Deputy Chairperson of Queen's Norman Foundation, Honorable uh, Yuli Minovis, President of Liberty International, Honorable Mosi Maimane, our host here, Federal Leader of the Democratic Alliance of South Africa, Honorable Hakainde Hichilema, President of the Zambia United Party for National Development, Honorable Stevens Ogalapa, President of African Liberal Network, Mr. Willis Martin, FNF Africa Regional Director, Honorable Anne Minitz, Honorary President of Liberal International, who have hosted us twice actually in uh, Belgium. Honorable Hans, Hans van Balen, MEP and President of, Afri uh, of the Alliance, sorry, not Africa. Maybe that's a sign of welcoming me as well. <laughs> President of the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Other distinguished guests, fellow liberals. Allow me to start by expressing my deep gratitude and thanks to the Africa Regional Office of the Frederick Norman Foundation for Freedom for extending invitation to me to talk about the state of freedom in Africa in this second annual African Freedom Speech and Award Ceremony. It is indeed a great pleasure and a big honor for me to be here and share a platform with such distinguished liberal icons from African Europe who will be speaking here today. Some of them have already sp spoken. Distinguished uh, liberal friends, Africa is a continent with many scars that are marks of its long and bitter struggle for freedom through the course of history. Slavery, colonialism, one-party dictatorships, military coups and rule, and here in South Africa, a long period of apartheid, all survived through suppression of freedom, political, economic, social, and cultural. But Africans, like all human beings, born with human dignity, whose core value is freedom, do not accept the humiliation and suppression of their humanity. They rose to fight and defeat each one of them, albeit with great sacrifice. But it was a sacrifice worth giving, for freedom is a precious value. It was Nelson Mandela who said in a famous quote during the Rivonia trial in 1964, that in I quote, I fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony with equal opportunity. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to see realized. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die." End of quote. Democratic and free society is what we all strive for. And of course, Africa has made big strides towards realizing that ideal. Slavery was abolished, colonialism came to an end, one-party systems were challenged and removed, and military junta's were forced to pave the way for civilian rule. As we speak today, Almost all African countries have embraced multi-party system. And I'm using the word multi-party system as opposed to multi-party democracy. And I'll tell the reason why. But the big question that we ought to ask ourselves is, are we free? Has multi-party system ushered in freedom and democracy? I'm afraid to say that in my humble opinion, the answer is no. I've been asked to confine myself to the good governance aspects of the state of freedom in Africa. Good governance being the theme of this 199th Executive Committee of Liberal International, and I intend to do so. When we look at the state of freedom in Africa in relation to good governance, we find that the continent is still a far cry from what it is heroes who fought for independence and freedom with their sweat and blood had wished for. But before I get into that, let me share with you what I see are the basic tenets of good governance. Good governance to me essentially means the rule of law as opposed to the rule by law. We all know what rule by law means, that all these dictators pass oppressive laws and govern by them, and they say that's a rule of law. That's not a rule of law. It's a rule by law. It must comprise of 
first and foremost, equality before the law and respect for and upholding of fundamental human rights and freedoms of individuals. Good governance must ensure a country is only governed by a constitutional government elected by citizens in periodic, free, fair, credible, transparent, and peaceful elections. And that such government uphold the constitution that it is citizen based and that ensures accountability through checks and balances built on the strong foundation of a clear and unambiguous separation of powers between the three main branches of the state, the executive, the, leg the legislature, and the judiciary. Equally important in good governance is free and independent media that inform the public and provide citizens with a forum to express themselves and exercise their right to freedom of speech and of information. On the other aspect, good governance should also mean equal opportunities for all the citizens and, the and that natural resources are utilized in a way that guarantees fair and equitable enjoyment of the basic amenities of life, not to be the essential public service. To me, these are the basic tenets of good governance, and I should say, by extension, the fulfillment of which I believe amounts to the enjoyment of freedom, or in the words of Thomas Jefferson, the pursuit of happiness. With that in mind, let me now go back to my proposition that Africa is still a far cry from being a continent where freedom is cherished and good governance is observed and explain myself as to why I paint such a gloomy picture. With the limited time that we have, I will have to confine myself to just a few aspects of good governance. I will start with free, fair, credible, transparent, and peaceful elections. And we don't need to go far to see the state of affairs on the aspect. The region of East, Eastern, Central, and Southern Africa, where we are, has witnessed the worst forms of disregard for the people's right to elect government of their choice and hence undermines accountability. For if those at the helm of power have put a mechanism that do not need the consent of those they govern for them to remain in power, why should they care to be accountable to them? We have witnessed how incumbents, be they the rulers or the ruling parties, install electoral commissions that they can manipulate and will never be able to declare them as election losers. In Zanzibar, where I come from, our party, the Civic Warrior Front, have won all the five elections since 1995, when multi-party system was reintroduced, but have always been prevented through the misuse of the Electoral Commission from taking over the government. It was most vivid in 2015, when we managed to collect all the results regression forms from all the counting stations, and therefore had evidence of our victory that we share with all the election observers, that the chairman of the Zambian Electoral Commission, Jecha Salim Jecha, acting under the instruction of the ruling party, CCM, realized that he had no other means but to nullify the entire elections. Neither the constitution of Zanzibar, nor the elections acts, provides the powers for the chairman or the Electoral Commission to nullify elections. And while still, their decisions cannot be challenged in any court of law. Other countries in the region that have experienced worse forms of the misuse of electoral commissions to keep the incumbent rulers or ruling parties in power include Uganda, Kenya, Ethiopia, Rwanda, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and DRC. But it is, this is also true of other parts of Africa as well, and has been witnessed in countries like Angola and the Gambia before the intervention of ECOWAS and the international community. The worst part of it is that the story does not end with rigging of the elections and imposing themselves in power. The big men of Africa, as they are referred to nowadays, then resort to persecution of their political opponents, especially those that are seen as resolute and will not be silenced. The leader of opposition in Uganda, Kiza Besije, has frequently been arrested, detained, and prosecuted on politically motivated charges. The last one being just this month. Diane Rugara, the leading critic who intended to challenge President Paul Kagame of Rwanda in the dust election, was, was disqualified by the Electoral Commission, and since then has been arrested twice and now faces prosecution for what are also seen as politically motivated charges. 
Just last week in DRC, 30 opposition members, followers of opposition leader Felix Tshisekedi, were arrested after they attended the political rally. Our own leader in Zanzibar, Saif Sharif Hamad, was threatened to be arrested last year, and only after intervention of some liberal leaders through Liberal International and African Liberal Network, through initiatives mainly done through Emil Kirias, and we are thankful to him that he was saved from arrest. But this did not save him uh, interrogation by the police for three hours. Honorable Hakain de Chilema, president of the UAPND, who will shortly be, who will shortly and deservingly be presented with the Africa Freedom Award for 2017 here, spent four months in detention on trumped up charges of treason for standing up against President Edgar Lins, and the list goes on and on and on. Coupled with election rigging has been the change of the constitution to remove term limits for their presidents. President Yoweri Museveni of Uganda, who, when he came to power in 1986, blasted African leaders for turning themselves live presidents, and even referred to the Zen Organization of African Unity, OAU, as a club of dictators, has himself changed the constitution to allow himself to remain in power. President Paul Kagame of Rwanda has done the same with the presidential term, where the presidential term is seven years, and he has just gone for his third term. In Burundi, President Pierre Nkurunziza has presided over worst form of brutality and killings of his opponents following his move to contest election for a third term, contrary to the Constitution and the Arusha Accord of August 2000 that he signed with the opposition party. As we speak here now, in Togo, citizens continue with street protests for over a month now that have costed lives of the demonstrators in a move to demand constitutional reform that would see the end of the dynastic rule of President Faure Nasidi. Disregard to the constitution, also roared it is her ugly head in Egypt, where the military junta overthrew the elected president, Mohamed Morsi. And since then, President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has laid a crackdown against leaders and members of the opposition, the civil society, the media, and even students who have stood up to challenge his rule. Of course, President Morsi himself had committed blunders when he, alienated him, when he alienated himself from the liberals who backed his candidature during the second round of the presidential election and started undermining the constitution and the judiciary by fielding it with judges loyal to him and his party. Here in South Africa, which has one of the best constitutions in Africa, we have recently heard of incidents where independent institutions such as the Office of the Public Protector been threatened after the office investigated corruption charges against President Jacob Zuma. In Kenya, which also boasts of having another democratic constitution in the continent, the recent threats by President Uhuru Kenyatta against the Supreme Court judges following the identification of the election results declared by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission does not augur well for the independence of the judiciary and the checks and balances provided for in the new constitution. Media has also not been spared in Africa. In Tanzania, over the past four months, four newspapers have been banned for publishing articles that are critical of President John Magufuli and his government. In South Cameroon, as we all know, a whole section of the citizens in the country are having their right of free speech undermined through crackdown on the use of English in both the media, including social media, in the schools and other public avenues. Political freedom aside, Africa also has a huge problem of economic disparity amongst its, people, amongst its people. The Bogen Project has put it that 48.5 of the population in Africa is living on less than 1.25, that is one and a quarter dollar per day, and 69.9% on less than two dollars per day, which places roughly 637 million Africans out of the total 910 million below the poverty line. The DRC, which is one of the richest countries in Africa in terms of natural resources, is the poorest country in Africa. The average life expectancy at birth for someone born in Southern Africa is 46. This tells a lot about a continent that is vast with vast natural resources. That is problem really is good governance. Let me end this part by giving you a good sign of the state of freedom and good governance in Africa. And that is the more Ibrahim Foundation has failed to find a suitable candidate for a third consecutive year to receive his Africa Leadership 
the world because all the retired presidents of Africa have failed the test put by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. So is the story only negative when it comes to the state of freedom in Africa? I'm sure you'll be asking yourself, but with what I said, does that mean Africa is doomed and there's no future as far as freedom and democracy is concerned? Of course not. Some progress has been made, and I believe it is the responsibility of these countries that have witnessed progress in freedom and democracy to stand up and assist those, those that are still struggling. As I mentioned, we have models of some of the best democratic constitutions in the world in Africa, with South Africa and Kenya showing the way. In so far as democratic elections and peaceful transfer of power concerned, West Africa is progressing well. Ghana, Senegal, Guinea, Nigeria are some of the examples. We hope the Gambia will also follow the path. Despite its democratic deficit, Rwanda has a good example of gender empowerment in politics, with over 50% of its parliamentarians being women. The last decade has witnessed growth of the middle class in many African countries. The advance of social, the, the advance of science and technology, especially in communication industry, has meant a huge growth of the users of smartphones and other devices, which mean more people in Africa, notably young ones, not only access information, but also use the devices to express themselves. We have seen the emergence of vibrant media in many parts of Africa. They've been exposing mega corruption scandals and thus keeping citizens informed who in turn have been demanding accountability from their leaders. What is more promising though, is the fact that Africa has the youngest population in the world. Africa Development Bank has published a finding that says that Africa has the fastest growing and most youthful population in the world, with over 40% under the age of 15, and 20% between the ages of 15 and 24. These young people are the ones challenging the status quo. They are the ones demanding accountability from their leaders and cherish their freedom and democratic rights more than anything else. I believe even the surge in Democratic Alliance performance in the local elections last year was driven by the youth who wants more than just lessons of history about the liberation struggle. While the liberation struggle is important in teaching us where we come from, it cannot and should not be used by the liberation parties to shield themselves from accountability and respect for good governance. In conclusion, that being the state of freedom in Africa, with serious challenges but also good signs of optimism, I would like to end my address by making the following appeals to my fellow liberals, both in Africa and outside, especially those who have gathered here in Johannesburg for the 199th Executive Committee of the Liberal International. One, I think there's a need for national leaders of the democratic parties, and we've got some here. There's a need for national leaders and democratic parties and movements in Africa to create a continental forum through which will be able to share information and also use it as a platform to advance the democratic cause in the continent. I think we see most of the leaders representing the authoritarian regimes, they try to protect each other and we have no avenue to speak about our ordeals and what we can do together. So I think such a forum would help us. We have got some regional ones, but I think we need a continental forum in which we can advance the cause of freedom in Africa. Two, African democratic parties and especially those from the liberal group that are in government, such as those in Ivory Coast and Senegal, should support their fellow democratic parties that face challenges in their countries. There's no reason why they shouldn't do so when we witness the authoritarian regimes in Africa support each other. And third, liberal friends outside Africa, and especially those in countries with leverage towards African governments, should continue to support the democratic forces in the continent by speaking out in their country's parliaments, in the European Parliament, in other available forums about violation of democratic and human rights, and demand accountability from their governments that support African despotic rulers. I understand it is a tough going for believers in democracy and freedom in Africa. But we have no alternative but to continue the struggle. And as the old saying goes, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And I believe in doing so, 
we are going to break free in Africa as well. Thank you very much.